Well, I'm speaking today from my experience of almost 50 years of living in and around small Christian communities, both in this country and overseas. And what I'm offering is a series of reflections from that experience. So don't expect an academic presentation. In 1974, I visited the original community of Larche in France. For those of you who maybe don't know Larche, it's a community that, uh, where life is shared between people with and without the experience of an intellectual disability. So I visited the original community in France for just six weeks and subsequently spent two years in the community of Winnipeg in Canada. Then I returned to Australia in 1976 and from 77 until 81 and again from 2003 to 2006 I lived as a member of the House of Prayer in Goulburn, New South Wales. Since 1981, Larche has been my primary community, specifically the community of Larche, Canberra, where I was in membership from 1978 until 2018. And during a time of international leadership of Larche, between 2012 and 2017, I lived six months of each year in the community of Lache Quays in northern France. So that's a bit the outline of the background that I bring to this reflection. So I've been asked to speak about new communities from 1960s until the present, and I think in order to do that, it's important to explore the context of the 1960s. 1960 was 15 years from the end of World War II, a war which had culminated with the unleashing of the atomic bomb. And this was closely followed by the revelations that came from the liberation of the camps and the Nuremberg trials. They were revelations which shocked the world because they held a mirror to the darkest aspects of the human heart. So in response to this reality, to this chaos, to these events, people were searching for ways to rebuild societies, to heal the wounds of war, and to create a unified Europe. And there were many responses that arose to the chaos of those times. I can name the rise of the anti-war movement and specifically the anti-nuclear movement in the face of what by then had become the Cold War. There were across the world the movements towards independence in European colonies. There was of course in the 1960s the expressive revolution which gave prominence to youth culture expressed in music, questioning of all forms of authority, rise of alternative forms of social organisation and a wide questioning of prevailing cultural standards. In the midst of this, Pope John XXIII called the, th the, the Va Second Vatican Council. The 1960s was also the decade of the space race and the moon landing, which completely changed our understanding of the universe in which we live. It was the time when the second wave of feminism was gathering momentum. And closer to home, the 1967 referendum signalled a significant step in the long journey towards justice for First Nations people in this country. So, against this background, young and not so young people were searching for an authentic way to live the message of the gospel, to bring the hope of the gospel in response to these realities. And the new communities which arose at this time, 
shared several defining characteristics. Firstly, they were responding to an identified need in the church and in the world. Their founders were usually charismatic people who communicated a strong and inspiring vision to their collaborators. These communities had a strong sense of mission, accompanied by a conviction that what they were doing truly would affect change in the church and in the world. They were essentially communities of lay people, where men and women, and often families, as well as ordained ministers and members of religious communities, were members. They had various levels of connection to ecclesial authorities. For some communities, there was a clearly defined link with the local church, and for others, it was much less formal. And in the context, the social context of the time, there was both an openness to what new communities might bring and also the space that enabled people to be creative in forming new communities. Many of these communities grew in remarkable ways, both in numbers and in outreach. Initially, most of them were established as a response to an identified need in an identified place at a particular time. They didn't begin with the vision to become large international networks of communities, for example. Although some were offshoots of communities that had been established elsewhere. But whatever the pattern of the foundation, these communities gave priority in differing degrees to option for the poor and action for justice, the link between prayer, contemplative prayer and action. They were often strongly linked to the peace movements of the 1960s and 70s because at that time the threat of nuclear war remained very real. There was an emphasis on simple living, often linked to a back-to-the-earth philosophy. As I mentioned, men and women and families sharing community life together, and significant space was given, if not to ecumenical dialogue, then to the engaging with the tension that divisions between the Christian churches can bring when we live our daily life together. They faced challenges, these new communities. They often began with a clear intent to challenge the established order, which is why they might have not sought links with the institutional church. But as a consequence of that, they often struggled with the accompanying isolation and lack of support from the institution. And in a social context where communes and cults were really having their heyday, some of the new communities were looked on with suspicion. In a context where the structures of authority were being questioned at every level, there could be ambiguity about how how authority was exercised in a community. And that often resulted either in disempowerment of the leader by the group or by the group abdicating authority to a charismatic leader. Where founders were strong personalities, questions of leadership succession often remained unaddressed and could eventually lead to serious division or even the demise of the community. I saw more than one community over the years cease to exist principally because the membership never grappled with the question of succession of leadership. So let's reflect now on the pattern of development of new communities in Australia during these years. 
And I would suggest that pattern of development took principally three different directions. Firstly, there were communities established which were an Australian response to a local need. These communities often arose from a church or a youth group linked to a church. Usually there was a clearly identified leader who inspired the group to respond to the identified need. Usually there was a clear link between the mission, that is the response to the identified need, and reflections on the teaching of scripture. And a, a network of communities, in fact, that always inspired me in this regard in this country were the communities founded by Athel Gill, specifically the House of Freedom in Brisbane, the House of the Gentle Bunyip in Melbourne, and the abode of the friendly toad in Adelaide. Some of these groups, which formed more out of the context of a, of a home church, but with very, um, very clear formation program of coming into membership, um, shared living, uh, community households, lived like that for years without ever identifying as a community until someone came along and told them they were a community. And that certainly happened with the Bundina community at the south of Sydney, at which point, understanding that they were a community, they then began to research communities and discover what that meant in terms of deepening their own identity. The second pattern of development of new communities in this country was those which were inspired by a community in another country. So these foundations usually adopted at least part of their spiritual practice and expression of mission focus from the community that was their inspiration. But at the same time, they had a freedom to develop in response to the actual situation in which they were living. And in my experience, the House of Prayer in Goulburn was a real example of that. Inspired by the experience of the founder at Madonna House in Compamere in Ontario, which was founded by Catherine de Huick Doherty, but translated into the Australian context and with a, a freedom to develop an expression that was not as maybe um, severe, shall we say, or rigorous as um, the Madonna House apostolate. And thirdly, there were those communities which were founded in relationship to an existing community elsewhere as part of the expansion of that community into a new part of the world or the expansion of the mission of that community into a new part of the world. This was often a more complex way of beginning as there were expectations on the part of both the local founders and the parent organisation as to the structures and the expression of, of mission of the community. And these expectations didn't always align. And I can speak out of that from my experience of being one of the founders of L'Arche in this country. In these situations, Tensions often arose regarding cultural adaptation, relationships with the original community, and understandings of authority. At the same time, these communities could access the experience and support of an older, more established community, particularly in times of crisis. Whatever the pattern of these foundations, a cultural thread that found its way into their sense of identity was a need to be validated by leadership of communities from over there, from elsewhere. We loved to have visiting community gurus come and tell us that we were okay. But eventually, during the late 1970s and into the 1980s, there arose a more defined need to lay claim to the lived experience and reflection of people in this country, on this part of the earth, whatever the origin of the communities to which we belonged. 
as communities grew in confidence in their identity as Australian communities, it was against the background of a wider search in the church to articulate an Australian spirituality. And this was a work that was taken up by theologians, by artists, by songwriters. And again, I found that the experience of the House of Prayer in Goulburn was that of a community who took this on in a very strong way. And the outworking of that remains today. Although the community itself no longer exists, the offshoot at Campfire in the Heart in Alice Springs has become a real centre for the expression of an Australian spirituality. So what is the call of the spirit to communities in Australia now in the 21st century? I find it interesting to ponder that question in light of the first synod of the Catholic Church which, in Australia which took place this month and where a similar question was being posed. The first thing is to acknowledge that the current context is quite different to that of the early 1960s. In the intervening decades, globalisation has had a huge impact on the way we understand and experience the world. There has been a huge technological revolution which has impacted every aspect of our lives, including the way we live our most significant relationships. In recent decades, almost every trusted institution has been revealed to have betrayed trust, whether we speak of churches, banks, police and justice systems, educational systems, sporting clubs. This has contributed to a level of social fragmentation which is expressed in the reluctance of people to commit to membership in formally trusted institutions, of which the church would have to be a primary example. They, we live with an increasing awareness of the devastating effects of climate change and environmental degradation, coupled with more recent experiences of the effects, effects of fire, floods and droughts. And this has given rise, among other things, this has given rise to a widespread general anxiety amongst people. And of course, in these days, we are living a global pandemic. In a way, it has never been lived before because we live not just our own reality, but we turn on the television and with the evening news, we, we tap in to the reality around the world. I believe that what we have not yet grappled with in the face of this rising, generalised sense of insecurity and anxiety is the extent of the residual trauma which these changes are affecting. Although the signs are surely there in the rising awareness of the rates of mental illness, the increasing fear of the needs of refugees, the prevalence of domestic violence. In many ways we're lost. Our confidence is diminished in the many places the needed leadership is lacking. So how might we discern the call of God to, the, to Australians in the 21st century? What is clear is that our world is in need of witnesses to the good news and that throughout history the most powerful witness to that good news has been found through the life of vibrant, faith-filled communities. As in the 1960s, the call of God will be discerned by listening to the cry of the most vulnerable people. And in these times, we must also include 
a deep listening to the cry of the earth and of all the life systems for whom it is home. If in previous decades communities chose alternative lifestyles with an emphasis on back to the earth and a rejection of materialism, today our very life depends on the choice to recognise and live out our obligations not only to one another but to the earth itself. In the face of needs which threaten to overwhelm us, questions which seem to have no answers, the way forward will be, as it always has been, through the life of communities grounded in prayer and contemplative reflection and engagement with the big questions of the day. And this implies an ability to mine the riches of the Christian tradition in the face of loss of trust in the institution. If communities in the 1970s and 1980s lacked relevance if they did not witness to the importance of the contribution of women and to ecumenical dialogue, the call today is to build forms of common life which are truly inclusive and welcoming of diversity of culture, race, gender and faith tradition, and which can address systemic issues of racism and abuse of authority within their own forms of social organisation. Perhaps the greatest temptation would be to allow nostalgia for the past to constrain our imagination in response to the need of today. The challenge, as in every era, is to discover the way in which the ancient wisdom will find expression in a context which it has never before encountered. In times of uncertainty and even chaos, we need to remember and have confidence in two things. They are two quotes from scripture which I will leave you with. The earth was a formless void. There was darkness over the deep and God's spirit hovered over the water. And know that I am with you always, yes, to the end of time. The Spirit of God has been with us since the beginning, hovering over the darkness and the void. And Jesus has promised he will be with us until the end of time.